presence of the Lord this morning. Let's stand together and sing the chorus, Sanctuary, that we've been singing the past few weeks. <clears throat> this be the prayer of your heart, that God would prepare your heart this morning to be a sanctuary for whatever He wants to give you this morning. Let's sing that again as a prayer. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary. I'd like to welcome everybody here this morning to Eastside Baptist Church. I don't know if you noticed or not, but there is a wonderful phenomenon. It's called the sun, and it was coming out. And this morning, we joined together to experience and see the S-U-N. Amen? I want to bring to your attention our little tear out that we have. If you are visiting with us this morning, we are ecstatic that you are here. I'd ask you that you'd please fill that out and that you would let us uh, have that as a record of your visit so we can know how we can minister unto your needs. If you're here this morning and you have a prayer request that you would like for me or other leaders of the church to know, if you would just uh, fill that out again and um, pass that in, then uh, we would love to have uh, a record of that, and know how we can pray for you. Also, uh, Doug was telling me that we are going to have a uh, discipleship weekend, um, and uh, he needs uh, people to volunteer uh, for host homes. I have seen some of these uh, on Facebook here recently. I've seen young people crowded around listening to the gospel uh, and being discipled through these things, and it is a wonderful, wonderful thing uh, that our church is offering. So um, if you would like to help in that way, if you would like to uh, be a host and you would like to be a part of youth being discipled, please see uh, Doug. and He'll fill you in on the details. Um, I'm going to ask you at this time to turn to Acts chapter 17. We're going to read verse 6 as our public reading of the Word of God this morning before we go into prayer. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some brethren to the rulers of the city, crying out. Now pay close attention to this. These who have turned the world upside down have come here too. This morning, as we enter into our message just a little bit later, we're going to look at the church that turned the world upside down. And God has a challenge for us this morning from that text. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, what a joy and what an honor it is that we can come together, that we can sing, and that we can praise your holy name, 
and that we can cry out for you to prepare our hearts as we did this morning. And Lord, as we come together to worship your Son, Jesus Christ, and as we look at this text that Paul and Silas, under your inspiration, turned the world upside down. And Lord, we know that you would desire to use the church today to turn this world upside down for you and for your will. This morning as we worship, I pray that you would prepare our hearts. I pray that you would draw us together. And I pray that you would speak to your people. For it's in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Our next hymn this morning may be new to many of you. In fact, it's not even in the white hymn book, so you'll have to follow along on the screen behind. It's called Worthy of Worship. If you know it, sing loudly so your neighbor can catch on. Let's stand as we sing.
choir is coming down, I'll ask you to stand. Greet each other this morning in the name of the Lord and shake someone's hand that you would not normally shake their hand. together. your question. How many of you love God this morning? Amen. So let's change the verse and say, I love him so this time. I love him so. I love him so. I love him so. He's so Thank you, and you may be seated. Good morning, family. He is so good to us, I tell you. It's such a wonderful thing. So good to see everyone this morning, uh, especially the visitors, most important folks here. Uh, we have uh, so many things to be praying about. We have uh, folks that are bereaving. We have folks that are in the hospital, folks that are recuperating. We have many things to go to the Lord in prayer, so let's go to the Father. Heavenly Father, we just come to you this morning with joyful hearts. We've just been singing your praises and just lifted our spirits. Father, we've sensed you, sensed your presence here this morning, Father. We just, we just ask that you be with us during this service, Father. We, we ask, Father, for many in our, our midst and our congregation that heard, we ask that you just be with the Siegler family and the passing of their Luana's father, we just ask you to just touch them, Father, and during their time of grief, just to be with them in a special way, be with the Woods family and the passing father there. Uh, continue to be with uh, Sister Bobby as she's down at Manor recuperating, Father. We just uh, ask that you just be with her during her rehabilitation. Uh, be with Sister Kay Sewell as, as she's been experiencing health problems. Father, we just ask that you just touch in that situation. Uh, we have many others, uh, Brother Bob Atkinson, uh, as he's uh, uh, at home with his daughter. Father, we just ask that you be with him. Uh, Father, just be with Buddy and Laverne Moore in a special way as, uh, uh, as she seeks you out to be able to find uh, the right place for Brother Buddy. Father, we just ask that you just uh, you just touch in that situation, Father, and, and just make it clear where, where he should be, Father. Father, we have many others on our prayer list. Uh, we know that you know every need that needs to be met, Father, and we just 
ask that you just meet them with your perfect will. Father, we just ask you to just continue to bless Pastor Josh as he brings us a message today. Father, we just are so thankful for him, thankful for his preaching, just preaching the gospel of gun barrel straight. Father, we just are, are just uh, lifted up by, by, by the preaching of your word, Father. Uh, Father, as we learn to study your word better in our lives, Father, we just ask that you just be with each one of us. Father, we just ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Before we uh, sing off to our hymn, I just want to say on behalf of Luana and myself, thank you for all the outpouring of love. Uh, you don't realize uh, how blessed we are here at Eastside just in terms of the way we wrap our arms around each other and take care of each other. And just want to say thank you during our, our time of loss, especially on, for Luana and her side of the family. And uh, whether you came to visitation or the funeral or made a call or a text message or had a part in put, putting that wonderful macaroni and cheese together, whatever you did. Or if you just whispered a silent prayer, just, just want you to know we appreciate it. And uh, God is good all the time. Let's stand as we sing our offertory hymn this morning, The Banner of the Cross, number 387. We'll sing first, second, and last verse. Mm, there's a royal banner given for display to the soldiers of the King. As an ensign there we lift it up today While the ransomed ones we sing Marching on, marching on For Christ counts everything but loss And to crown Him King Toil and sing Neath the banner of the cross Though the foe may rage and gather as the flood, be displayed, and beneath its folds as soldiers of the Lord, for the truth be not dismayed. Marching on, marching on, for Christ counts everything but loss. And to crown him king, toil and sing, neath the banner of the cross. When the glory dawns, is drawing very near, by day, then before our king the foe shall disappear. And the cross the world shall sway Marching on, marching on For Christ counts everything but loss And to crown Him King Toil and sing Neath the banner of the cross Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, for this time that you've allowed us to come back to your house to worship, God. And God, we want to remember all the prayer requests that were made today, God. You know each situation, you know what's involved in each circumstance, God. And we just pray that your will would be done in each and every one. Now we just pray with Pastor Josh, God, that you just hide him behind the cross this morning, God, and just give him the words that uh, we need to hear that'll make us better Christians, better witnesses for you, God. Now we pray for these tithes and offerings that it be used for the furtherment of your kingdom. These things we ask in your precious name. Amen. Amen.
I'd like for you to take your Bibles this morning and turn with me to the book of Acts. This morning we're going to look at chapter 17, and we are going to examine the first 15 verses of this text. Three pastors were eating lunch together because that's what pastors do. They eat lunch. Then they try to run. Some look like Pastor Mark for the half marathon, and others look like um, a person that escaped from the loony bin with Alabama gear on. <laughs> Nonetheless, they, they will try to run off the food they ate. These three pastors are eating lunch, and they all have the same problem in their church. They have a problem with bats. One pastor, who's a Methodist pastor, said that uh, he gathered all the bats together, put them in the trunk of his car, drove them to the ocean, let them go free, and they beat him back to the church. The Presbyterian pastor said that he had done something of the same thing. He had gathered the bats together in this cage. He had taken them to the woods where they would be happy. He had set them free in the woods, but they had beat him back. They noticed that the Southern Baptist pastor is quiet. He is smirking a little bit as he is sipping his coffee. And both of them turn to him and they say, why are you so calm about this? We all have the same problem. The pastor says, well, I got rid of my bats. They said, what did you do? You got to let us in on your secret. He said, it's an age-old secret. He said, let us know. He said, I took all of my bats, and I baptized them into the membership of the church, and I haven't seen them since. (laughs) It's a terrible reputation, the church can have at times, that we're passionate about the gospel, we lead people to Christ, we baptize them, and oftentimes, we don't see them anymore. Oftentimes, we lose track of them. They may start on the front row, even though there's literally nobody on the front row here, and uh, they move on back and keep our eye out. If we don't have a proper mind towards discipleship, they're out of the church. And before you know it, we think, man, it's been been a while since I've seen him. It's been a while since I've seen her. They make their way out of the church. But this morning, I want to speak to you on the subject of the church that turned the world upside down. Because I do believe that the Bible teaches that there is such a church and there is such a commitment that took the gospel in believing the gospel with the power of the Spirit and they turned the world upside down with it. Now while we are going to look at all 15 verses and while they all apply here to build on the message today, The thrust of this text comes from the second half of the sixth verse. We read that this morning. The complaint and the charge was, these two men have turned the world upside down. That is an interesting statement. That is a powerful criticism. Do you know that most people will live their entire lives and when they die, they will have impacted almost nobody. Few people will really know that they even existed. The community won't suffer when they die. Do you know as sad as it is that there is many a church that if they had to close their doors, it would not impact the community in the least bit. But yet these two men had been on the scene for two weeks. Two weeks. And the charge was, these two men 
are the men that have turned the world upside down. From the inception of the church of Acts, the first church, the early church, the power of God, the anointing of God was on this church. When they spoke, people heard the power of God. When they moved, people saw the power of God. This church would spend time praying together. And as the church was being persecuted, as they were running for their lives, it caused them to seek prayer more heavily in that persecution. And that prayer caused them to go sharing the gospel wherever they were going. You see, Satan thought he had won. Satan thought there was a victory to be had because he had brought persecution to the church. But what he didn't realize was he was actually the greatest evangelist that maybe ever lived because as he brought the heat to the church and as the church split off, they went off sharing the gospel and more people getting saved as they went. That church was a church that was known for turning the world upside down. This morning, many a church has little impact. They have little effect. But you know, through the gospel of Jesus Christ, I believe there is a wake-up call for the church this morning. You see, last week we looked at revival and we looked at how we could be revived and how we could live a revived life for Christ. And yet this morning, God has spoken to me to bring you this message on how a church could get its voice back and how the church could get its testimony back and how the church could once again be an entity, be a family, be a people that has an impact and has an effect on the culture that it's around. Now just imagine this. What if, what if the ACLU said, that church is causing trouble? That church is destroying our culture. That church is responsible for these people coming to Christ and these people leaving sin. What if there was a charge today in our culture from the abortionist that said, because of this church movement, people have repented and people don't want to have abortions anymore and people want to Spread life. What if our culture was ready to shut the church down because the impact in the community was people are repenting of sin, they are coming to Christ, and they are leaving behind the sin they once knew. This was the problem. This was the problem that the people saw with Paul and Silas. This morning... I believe in my heart of hearts that as it's time for a church revival, as it's time for the church to have its voice back, why can't that start here? Why can't that start in liberty? Why can't that start with Eastside Baptist Church? Because God has established this church and there is a special mission and a special voice he has given you, he has given us, and a special work for us to do. Let it begin here at Eastside Baptist Church. Join me in the text as we're looking at Acts chapter 17 and we look at the first 15 verses. Now, when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they had came to uh, Thessalonica where there was a synagogue of the Jews. Then Paul, as his custom was, went into them and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and demonstrating 
that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead. And saying, this Jesus, whom I preach to you, is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded. And a great multitude of the devout Greeks, and not a few of the leading women, joined Paul and Silas. But the Jews, who were not persuaded, becoming envious, took some of the evil men from the marketplace, and gathering a mob, set all the city in an uproar, and attacked the house of Jason, and sought to bring them out to the people. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some brethren to the rulers of the city, crying out, These who have turned the world upside down have come here too. Jason has harbored them, and these are all acting contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying, There is another king, Jesus. And they troubled the crowd and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. So when they had asked secret or they had taken secretly from Jason and the rest, they let them go. Then the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. When they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. Therefore, many of them believed, and also not a few of the Greeks, prominent women uh, as well as men. But when the Jews from Thessalonica learned that the word of God was preached by Paul at Berea, They came there also and stirred up the crowds. Then immediately the brethren sent Paul away to go to the sea, but both Silas and Timothy remained there. Verse 15, So those who conducted Paul brought him to Athens, and receiving a command for Silas and Timothy to come to him with all speed, they departed. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we come before you this morning. And Lord, we know that there is a special and a unique message that you want to deliver, that you want to share, that you want to preach through your beloved word to this congregation and all of those watching online as well. And Lord, I pray this morning that your word would be heard, that your word would be felt. I pray this morning that you would do a spiritual work within this time. And Lord, I pray that if there is anybody here this morning that does not know you, if there is anybody here this morning that is not walking with you, if there is anybody here this morning that is lost before you, and they can't answer the question, what would happen right now if I were to die? Would I go to heaven? Would I go to hell? Oh, Lord, if they are not sure of that answer, I pray that you would do a spiritual work in their heart. Like Lydia, I pray you would open their heart. You would have them believe. Lord God, I pray you draw them to yourself today. For it's in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ we pray. And all God's people said, amen. As we begin to look at this church that turned the world upside down, There are four principles within this text that we must examine. First, I want you to notice in verse 1 and the first part of verse 2, a correct passion. A correct passion. The church that is going to turn the world upside down is going to have the right passion. They're going to have the correct passion. They're going to have a gospel drive. They are going to be passionate and compassionate about the gospel. I recently heard an old 
a preacher named Adrian Rogers that said, the church that does not have the desire for evangelism and the church that does not have the desire for soul winning is not worthy of the ground they are occupying. We are here to win lost people. We are here to make disciples. That must be our passion. That must be our drive. That must be what gets us out of bed in the morning. That must be what our life is about. Leading people to Christ and discipling them in the way of the master. Let that be our life. But our culture today, our so-called experts today, they say door-to-door evangelism is dead. They say it doesn't work anymore. They say you can't just go into a neighborhood that you don't know. You can't just knock on a door. You can't just start talking to the person. You can't go into the gospel. You can't be passionate about Jesus. You can't lead people to Christ anymore that way. Moderns won't have it. People won't accept it. It simply will not work. There was a time where it did, but it does not work any longer. Kentucky Baptist pastor, Mark Bishop, I believe his name was. There's an article about him. He led his church who was declining and who was struggling and who was getting ready to close their doors to go out and to knock on two hundred doors a week in a certain span of time that so-called experts would say is a waste of time he saw that church triple in its size he saw people come to Christ He saw people get saved. He saw people come into the church. He baptized the people into the church. They became ministry workers. They became uh, in the program of discipleship, and they are still a part of the church today. People are always going to tell you it doesn't work. People are always going to say, that's old school. People are always going to say, you're crazy for trying that. But you know what I've learned? Most of your so-called experts like that, that have their PhDs, it's quite clear that the PhD stands for post hole digger, and it does not stand for anything eloquent. Listen, we must be faithful with a gospel passion to go and to reach the lost. God will dictate the results. Do you know that when you go share the gospel, you're not responsible for whether a person comes to Christ. You're only responsible before God for your faithfulness. A church that turns the world upside down is gonna take that passion outside of these walls and they're going to impact the community they've been placed in. It takes a gospel passion. Number two, if you look at the second part of verse 2, and you look at verse 3 and verse 11, we notice that this church had the correct message. They had the correct message. You must have the passion. People must feel your passion, and they must see and experience your passion. After all, the world was never turned upside down by boring people. But I want to tell you, you can have all the passion in the world. You can have all the passion that there is to have. But if the correct message with the correct content is not there, it is a lost passion. We must take the proclamation of the scriptures to the people. We must invest in what is known as biblical exposition, where we take the word of God And we explain the word of God. Listen, preachers will have illustrations until Jesus comes back. But the illustration is not where the power is. My thoughts and my ideas are not where the power is. The power is in the word. The power is in the scriptures. The power is in the Bible. 
You don't need my opinions. You don't need my philosophies. You don't need those things. You need what the Bible says. The Bible says that this word makes us wise unto salvation. And in the text, you see that Paul went into the synagogue. He took several Sabbath days and he preached his own ideas, right? No, he reasoned with them, with the Scriptures. He took the Word of God with the Spirit of God and as the man of God, he gave them the Word. And what's the result? People coming to Christ. What's the result? People getting saved. What's the result? People being made wise unto salvation. And it says not just a few. And prominent people with prominent positions heard the gospel, heard the word, and they gave their life to Christ. We must be faithful to give the word. Another myth I hear, you can't do preaching like that. You can't just get up and explain the Bible. You can't just preach the Bible. You've got to be the celebrity pastor. You've got to be cool. You've got to have style. You've got to have charisma. If anybody's ever going to listen to you or ever going to respond to you, you have to be that kind of person. Yet, in a different era... There was a man that went to a prominent First Baptist church. He sat down with the deacons and he said to them, I am going to preach verse by verse through all of the 66 books of the Bible. They said, Pastor, we love you. Pastor, we're glad you're here. But Pastor, you're going to kill our church. He said, well, I'm going to do it anyway. (laughs) Fifty years later, That church that had an astounding 7,000 people when he went there had 26,000 people and became the largest church in the Southern Baptist Convention at that time. You know what I believe? I believe people want the word. I believe people want to hear the word. I believe people don't need my counsel and philosophy on life. They need the Bible, they need the scriptures, and they need the word of God. Cool is not going to help you when tragedy strikes. Cool is not going to help you when you suffer. Cool is not going to be on your side when you need the pure meat of the Word of God to get you through and to build you up. Cool doesn't make disciples, the Word of God does. They had the right message. Notice uh, verse 4 and verse 12 here. They had the correct commitment. If you look closely at verse 4, and you look closely at verse 12, you can see what the commitment was. They were making disciples. Now, there's a big difference between making converts, drawing converts, and making disciples. There's a difference between a gathering and a congregation. People gather at sporting events. People gather at rock concerts. People gather at a lot of different venues, but they are not a family. They're not a family. A congregation is a family of people under the Father. Under the blood of Jesus, we are a family. Paul was making disciples. And you have to ask, when you look at your church, what is our church producing? Because that is the evidence of success. What's our church producing? What is being produced? Is it disciples or is it converts? They had to ask some hard questions. And in the text, we we see those hard questions. So how do you move from converts To disciple. How do you move from just drawing a crowd to just drawing faithful, committed disciples? There must be an intentional effort on discipleship, on people desiring to be disciples and to make disciples. One of the greatest joys 
of my ministry is when a person comes to me in the church and they say, Pastor, can I have a moment of your time? Pastor, can I talk to you for just a moment? God is leading me to do this ministry. God is leading me to teach this class. God is leading me to this people. God is leading me to be used in this church with this ministry. My heart rejoices. My heart cries out. The other day I had somebody, very special somebody, message me. and He had an old idea about a new ministry that he was passionate about and wanted to see happen at this church. I rejoiced over that and wanted to talk about it. You see in Ephesians 4, verse 11 and 12, the text in that passage gives one of the main purposes of the pastor. And that is to equip the saints to do the work of the church. It's amazing, but it was never God's plan for a pastor of any kind to do all the work in the church. It was the plan of the people to come together to be the disciples and to do the ministry that God has called them to do. And I want to personally communicate to you here this morning. My office door is always open. My phone is always on. If God is leading you, come see me. Come talk to me. If you want to be used in this way, come talk to me. Let Eastside be a church of strong discipleship where ministry is going on. You can... Attempt to build a church through a gimmick, through a program, through an over-the-top approach that today might be way high, but tomorrow when that fat is gone, it's way down. But if you build the church the way that Jesus instructed us to build the church, off of ministry and off of the word of God, it doesn't ever go out of style. Let's build the church the word of God through strong discipleship. Which brings me to my last point this morning, the painful one. Verses five through nine, verse 13 through 15. Oh dear me, whenever you start making disciples, whenever you start preaching the truth, you're going to run into that word that we don't like. That word called conflict. Do you notice in the text that people are coming to Christ, they're leaving sin, they're repenting, and they are being discipled, and there is a mob that is formed. There is a gang that is formed. People are coming at them for blood. They want this to stop now. I want to promise you something. Satan is not going to waste his time in the bar. Everything is going his way there. Satan is not going to waste his time in the drug houses. Everything is going his way there. Satan is not going to waste his time in those places where he wants to be is in the church of God destroying the church that Jesus desires to build. We will run into conflict. You will run into conflict when you preach God's word, you live God's word, you trust God's word, and you are leading others to do it as well. When people are coming to Christ and they're becoming stronger in the word, and God is really blessing the church. Watch out because you're going to see the conflict. What we must do is be strong in the word of God. What we must do is hold strong the promises of God. What we must do is put on the full armor of God according to Ephesians 6. What we must do is bathe not just ourselves, but bathe one another in prayer. I hope that you have the leadership of this church's name down in your prayer book, in your devotional life. And as you are reading the word and as you are growing, I hope you are praying for the leadership of this church. Because that's where Satan will attack first. We must understand that God desires to build. Satan desires to tear down. And let us be before the Lord. Let us be in the book. And let us be in a spirit of prayer. 
this morning, as we have in the text outlined for us, all of the marks, all of the cup, all that you need to know in order to be part of a church that desires to turn this world upside down. The question is, who is ready? Who is ready to step out of the crowd? Who is ready to be part of this church? Who is ready to take this word? Who is ready to let God use them to be a disciple maker, strengthener, as he sustains us as a church? Will you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, God, we come before you this morning. And Lord, we are just so amazed at your love, at your faithfulness, at your commitment to us. Lord, in the way that you lead, in the way that you guide, in the way, Lord, that you have your hand upon Eastside Baptist Church. Lord, I personally thank you for calling me, my wife, to Eastside Baptist Church. I thank you for allowing us to be here. Thank you for using me as the spiritual leader of such an awesome people. Such an honor and such a privilege in my life. And Lord God, I, I pray that in the days ahead, you would give me wisdom. You would give me clarity. You would give me vision. You would help me, Lord, to lead this wonderful place and lead it to where you want it to go, with your vision, not mine, in play. Lord, I would just simply echo and just simply ask, there is somebody here this morning that just doesn't know you, that needs to trust you today. I pray they would come forward. I pray they would, st they would step out today. Lord, I pray for those that do know you. I pray for those that are stellar voices in this church, I pray for those that you already have your hand on. Lord, I pray that we, I pray that we would bind together today, and that we would gather around this altar today, and that we would desire to be the church that turns this world and this culture upside down. For it's in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. But Alan is Let here. Let us stand, hymn number 347, I'll I Surrender receive you. All. The Lord is calling you today, come. The Lord is drawing you today, come. Step out. Oh, to Jesus I surrender all oh, to Him I freely give. I will ever love and trust Him in His presence day. What a privilege it's been for us to be in the house of God this morning. What an awesome worship service. What a time. I would ask you that as you leave this building today, as you are the church, but as you leave this building today, pray hard for what God wants to do in this place. Pray that together 
we would be the church this week as we minister in the community. Remember, there are people that you have a relationship with and that you know that I don't have that relationship with and that I could possibly never impact. And you may be the only Jesus somebody sees. Let them know who you are. Love them. Share the word with them. I'm going to ask uh, Oscar if he would close us in a word of prayer uh, this morning.